Good evening, everybody. Nice to see you all. So I thought I'd make a few comments about the very original origin of this project, particularly for our students who haven't been here since 2014 when we began to work on the project, which is um, resulting in this project in Palermo. So as you, most of you probably already know, installed within the collection or within the villa uh, here is a collection of some 6,000 objects consisting of paintings, sculpture, um, decorative arts, paperweights, books, um, the collection of a family in the entirety of the, almost the entirety of the 20th century. The villa and the collection were left to us, to New York University, in 1995 on the death of the last member of the family, the Acton family, with the proviso that we keep the collection installed in the way that we received it. This becomes important when the question is raised, why do we keep these objects in the collection? So within the collection are 35 of these objects called lacamoires. They are polychrome sculptures, usually, although these are not representative of the Labise, maybe, diminutive in size, deep black paint um, coloring uh, their skin, and usually they're positioned in positions of service, holding a tray outstretched to collect gloves of a visitor, um, hand outstretched holding a lamp uh, to light your way as you enter the room. Usually, art historians view them as unimportant pieces of decorative art, the function of which is to serve as foils for a more important work that they surround. So these two framing the beautiful tapestry, um, and they're meant to kind of reflect even the themes inside the tapestry. When I first came to the villa, the guide that showed me around um, dutifully called our attention to these objects that they were considered, uh, no, I called our attention to the important works, the tapestries, the paintings, um, through which we were to understand that the Actons, this Anglo-American family, were wealthy, cultivated, cosmopolitan, interested in the world. Um, the blackamoor holding the lantern in the espresso when you came in was described to us um, as uh, being in fashion. Um, these sculptures were in fashion throughout Europe in the 17th and 18th century, and that they were symbols, in her words, of exotic luxury. But to me and to the many students who come here from the United States, and elsewhere, but particularly in the United States, they are startling and disturbing. Encountering the Black Moors is uncomfortable because far from blending into a construction of wealth, um, the Black Moors more resemble in American cultural history the, the jockeys that dotted the lawns, this is of a certain generation for the American school of middle-class homes in the United States in a horrifying identification with the slave um, plantations of the American South. Americans, as Americans, we view them in the context of our own history, a painful record of slavery and discrimination still violently played out on the streets of the United States. But this is the educational advantage of this global network university of studying abroad. To be provoked by discomfort, to understand something about the world in which we are learning. Though these black moors are not generally read as subjects of history, they do exist within a complicated history of exchange between Italy and Africa including the 15th century African slavery in Italy, which these objects depict, maybe not these, those, the period of colonialization during which they were collected and displayed, 
And finally, 21st century Italy with a new influx of Africans migrating to Italy. Some years ago, we invited Professor Alessandra De Maio to design a series which she entitled Black Italian to begin to examine these issues. That was in 2014 and 2015. And then in 2015, with all of our great friend, Awam Amka, who tried to join us today but could not leave his class in Abu Dhabi, we began to talk about a project to help to understand what it means for NYU to have within its collection of art in Florence these strange and uncomfortable objects. And we designed um, an exhibition to look at the objects through the lens of contemporary artistic <coughs> practice. And in 2015, we installed an exhibition of 47 artists, a large exhibition of 47 artists within this collection, Villa Bardini downtown and um, the Biagiotti Gallery. And now, with Mayor Orlando and the extraordinary writer and activist Wale Shoinka, the project moves to Palermo to continue to explore the artistic and cultural relations between Africa and the West across the Mediterranean. So with that brief introduction of the context at NYU, I turn the introductions <coughs> to our student, Shani Butler. Alessandra Di Maio is an associate professor of English and postcolonial studies at the University of Palermo, Italy. She divides her time between Italy and the US, where she taught at several universities after earning her PhD in comparative literature at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Her research includes postcolonial black diasporic migratory gender studies and transnational culture, cultural identities. She is currently working on a project on African Italian literature and the Black Mediterranean. She has been the recipient of a Fulbright Scholarship, a UCLA Mellon Postdoctoral Fellowship, and a MacArthur Research and Writing Grant. Among her publications are Tutuola at the University, The Italian Voice of a Yoruba Ancestor, An African Renaissance, Worlds in Progress, a Study of Contemporary Migrant Writings, and Dedica a Wole Shoinka. She has translated into Italian several authors, among them Nigerian Nobel laureate Wole Shoyinka, with whom she has conceived the poetry anthology Migrazioni, or Migrations. Mayor Leo Luca Orlando is the current mayor of Palermo. He has a long history of public service. Between 1978 and 1980, he was the legal advisor to the president of the region of Sicily, Pier Santi Mattarella, who was killed in 1980. The same year, he was elected as a city commissioner with the Christian Democratic Party. From 1985 to 1990, he served as the mayor of Palermo. During this period, known as the Palermo Spring, Orlando assembled a city council of left-wing parties and movements, breaking the hegemonic party structure in place up to then. He also participated in anti-mafia conferences, promoting the growth, the growth of the anti-mafia movement and a cultural awakening that would culminate in the birth of the pro-democracy movement, La Reta, in 1991. His engagement is political, social, and cultural. He denounces the danger that the mafia economy poses from which mafia gangs derive their power and the alliances that grow out of it. La Rete is known for its role as bulwark in Italian politics against corruption and mismanagement and seeks to put moral questions back to the center of Italian politics using a transversal approach that includes positive currents from various political parties. In 1991, Orlando was elected to the Regional Assembly in Sicily of the La Rete Lis. In 1992, was elected to the Italian Parliament, and in 1993, he was re-elected mayor of Palermo with 75% of the vote. He continued the process he had started during the first mandate to withdraw contracts from companies that were suspected of belonging to mafia families. In 1994, he was elected a deputy of the European Parliament. He was a member of the Greens Group and worked for a stronger role of the Mediterranean in the EU. He was also confirmed as a member of the European Commission on Public Freedom and International Affairs and was asked to participate on the Commission on Regional Policies. 
He was re-elected mayor of Palermo in 1997 with 58.5% of the vote. Since 1998, he is the president of the Car Free Cities Club, a European alliance of cities that promotes sustainable urban mobility, reducing the use of private cars. In 1999, he joined the Democratic Party, founded by Romano Prodi. In 2000, the group of Liberals and Democrats of the European Parliament awarded him the European Civic Prize for his work against organized crime and the civic renewal of his city. In Philadelphia, in 2000, he was given a prize in memory of Bayard Rustin, a symbol of human rights. In 2000, Al Gore, Democratic Party candidate for President of the United States, invited him to participate in an international leaders forum in Los Angeles. He was awarded honorary citizenship of Palermo, Colombia in 2000 and was re-elected mayor of Palermo in May 2012. Wolosha Yinka is a Nigerian playwright and political activist who received the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1986. He sometimes wrote of modern West Africa in a satirical style, but his serious intent and his belief in the evils inherent in the exercise of power usually was evident in his work as well. A member of the Yoruba people, Shoyinka attended government college and university college in Ibadan before graduating in 1958 with a degree in English from the University of Leeds in England. Upon his return to Nigeria, he founded an acting company and wrote his first important play, A Dance of the Forest, for the Nigerian independence celebrations. The play satirizes the fledgling nation by string, stripping it of romantic legend and by showing that the present is no more a golden age than was the past. He also wrote several plays in a lighter vein. But his more serious plays, such as The Strong Breed, Kanji's Harvest, the first, Open the First Festival of Negro Arts in Dakar, 1996, published 1967, The Road, From Zia with Love, and even the parody King Babu, reveal his disregard for African authoritarian leadership and his disillusionment with Nigerian society as a whole. His best works exhibit humor and fine poetic style as well as a gift for irony and satire and for accurately matching the language of his complex characters to their social position and moral qualities. From 1960 to 1964, Shoyinka was co-editor of Black Orpheus, an important literary journal. From 1960 onward, he taught literature and drama and headed theater groups at various Nigerian universities, including those of Ibadan, Ife, and Lagos. After winning the Nobel Prize, he, was, he also was sought after as a lecturer, and many of his lectures were published, notably the Wreath Lectures of 2004 as Climate Affair. Though he considered himself primarily a play playwright, Shrinka also wrote novels. His verse is characterized by a precise command of language and a mastery of lyric, dramatic, and meditative poetic forms. He wrote a good deal of poems from prison while he was jailed in 1967 to 69 for speaking out against the war brought on by the attempted secession of Biafra from Nigeria. <laughs> the Man Died is his prose account of his arrest and 22-month imprisonment. Shoyinka's principal work is Myth, Literature, and the African World, a collection of essays in which he examines the role of the artist in the light of Yoruba mytho mythology and symbolism. Art, Dialogue, and Outrage is a work on similar themes of art, culture, and society. He continued to address Africa's ills and Western responsibility in the open sore of a continent and the burden of memory, the muse of forgiveness. Shoyinka was the first black African to be awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. An autobiography, Ake, The Years of Childhood, was published and followed by the companion pieces um, Isra, A Voyage Around Essay, and Ibadan, The Pengalem's Years, A Memoir. In 2006, he published another memoir, You Must Set Forth at Dawn. He also served on the Encyclopedia Britannica Editorial Board of Advisors and has long been a proponent of Nigerian democracy. His decades of political activism included periods of imprisonment and exile, and he has founded, headed, or participated in several political groups, including the National Democratic Organization, the National Liberation Council of Nigeria, and pro-national conference organizations. In 2010, he founded the Democratic Front for People's Federation and served as chairman of the party. We're deeply grateful for their time and experience. Thank you very much, Shanae. Um, I'm very happy, honored, and quite frankly, thrilled of being here with you all today. And 
I'm acting only as a bridge, so I will just take one minute of your time to tell you that actually uh, this is all happening because it started here, in this place, in this community, and Ellen Toscano told you about the story of the Blackamoors. There are so many uh, anecdotes uh, about this that you know we can talk about later uh, in front of a drink. But, uh, but when I... Um, started to talk about these issues with two people who, for me, are two beacons. I don't usually say these things, but both Professor Sholinka and the mayor of my city, of my hometown, Leluc Orlando, are two beacons for different reasons and for similar reasons, for my formation, for that of my generation, in my hometown, and globally, because of their example, because of their guidance, and because they both uh, in different ways, consider art and culture and the humanities as a site of action and as a south, site of progress in the purest sense of the term. So when I shared you know, the project of a community, because it really takes a village, and tried to bring it to Palermo, this could all be possible because of them. So I will leave the floor to them to tell you what the project is about. I will just say that I'm very honored to launch the Encounter the Black in the Mediterranean Blue today with you all. And there is a huge event going on in Palermo in June, in early June, called Resignifications, the Black Mediterranean, with performances, exhibits, a conference, and you're all invited. And remember where Palermo lies in Sicily, between Africa, between Europe. We are the bridge. As a bridge, I'll just, you know, keep quiet. And I will invite Mayor Orlando to come here. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thanks. Thanks for this invitation. I wish to say thanks to New York University, to Evelyn Toscano, and I wish to say to Shane, thanks for your institutional presentation, but I wish just to introduce me <laughs> with the human introduction. I am a grandfather. I am a German actor. I am a writer, and I am the founder, the president of Italian Federation of American Football. <laughs> so, I think that was necessary to know just to what I do when, when I'm not involved in politics. I am the mayor of Palermo, and I am proud to be the mayor of Palermo. The city of Palermo decided five years ago, 500 years ago, 500 years ago, to have as a protector the son of a slave, an African slave, sold in the port of Palermo. Imagine. 500 years ago, the city council, you can say, Senato Pretorio, decided that it was necessary to have as protector just uh, the son of a slave, an African slave. That only 200 years after was declared the center by the Vatican. I think that is a, a clear message about uh, our attitude to welcome everybody. I am. Uh, the mayor of Palermo, I was recently, six months ago, elected the saying during the electoral campaign that my two important names were Google and Ahmed the migrant. Google, that means uh, virtual connection. Ahmed or Sara, or the migrant, or Luca, the migrant, that means uh, the human connection. We are today living uh, a really new experience. There is no city in the world who changed so deeply culturally in the last 40 years like Palermo. Yes, I know. Berlin changed. Moscow changed. Praga changed. Warsaw changed. But no one of those cities changed like Palermo because those cities changed in connection with international changes, in connection with institutional changes. Uh, the end of Soviet Union, the reunification of Germany. We changed without changing our constitution. We changed in the mind. Palermo 40 years ago was the capital of the mafia. Today is capital of the culture. 
And we have to say thanks to the people who dedicated their life in fight against the mafia. And uh, I wish to say thanks to people who lost the, the life in fight against the mafia. But I wish even to say thanks to the mafia. Because the mafia killed too much. Obliged everybody to open their eyes, to speak, to hear. The people in Palermo reacted because it was too violent, the presence of the mafia. I love German culture, German language is my second language. Sicilian, of course, is my first, probably Italian is my fourth. <laughs> uh, I have to check my professor in the, in the school. But uh, German people today are much better than before Adolf Hitler. After Nazism, the German people became better. And I'm sure that the Muslim will become better, thanking Islamic State. Because we were obliged to react to the violence of the mafia. When somebody organized a robbery in Paris, people think that it's dangerous because it's robbery. When somebody organized a robbery in Palermo, people is afraid because things can be mafia. And uh, I think that Palermo is today just a city who has decided just to promote identity. I'm sorry for Frankfurt, I'm sorry for Berlin, <laughs> but Palermo is not a European city. It's not a European city. Palermo is a Middle East city in Europe. According to you solely, we are proud to be European, of course. Palermo is not Frankfurt, Palermo is not Berlin. Palermo is Beirut, it's Istanbul. Our project is to let Palermo to be buried with Wi-Fi and tram. <laughs> Taxi sharing, of course, car sharing, of course. Probably you don't know, but Palermo and Milan are today the best cabled city in the Mediterranean area. The best cabled city. So we are on the way to be buried with Wi-Fi and tram, or if you prefer, to be Brussels welcoming everybody. When somebody asked me, how many migrants are in Palermo? I do not reply 60,000, 70,000, 80,000. I reply, no one who arrives in Palermo becomes Palermo. We need just to receive the message of the migrants. Uh, they are a tremendous positive tribute to the new Mediterranean area. I will never use the word Euro Mediterranean. Because my African friends say, why Euro, not Africa? And my Asiatic friends say, why Euro, not Asia? Mediterranean for us is a continent of water. A continent of water. It's a dimension of identity. I remember what happened in 1492, uh, when uh, an Italian discovered America when uh, Lorenzo il Magnifico died. And when uh, the king and the queen, the Catholic king and queen of Spain, decided to be against Jewish and Muslims. From that moment, the Mediterranean area, that was considered something like the ocean of the world, has become a lake of periphery. Just a lake of periphery of conflicts, of wars, in name of God the opening of Suez Channel, and the migration is giving to, to the Mediterranean area a tremendous contribute for a new future, for a new future. And we wish to be just the, in this area a positive point, welcoming everybody. Palermo is today capital of the country. We will lost next June manifesto. It will be fantastic just to have the opening of manifesto with the re-exhibition in Palermo. The black bodies. But this morning, I was in Palermo in press conference with Spencer Tunic. And tomorrow, I will inaugurate just an exhibition in the same space where we we'll have uh, the, this, uh, this fantastic uh, Initiative of Boleso Inca, Spencer Tunic, a fantastic, uh, famous photographer, the fantastic exhibition of nudes. So the bodies, 
the bodies will be just for six months the message of the city of Palermo to the world. And we wish just to say that uh, it is necessary to say thanks to the migrants because they remember us our rights. Not their, our. We have approved the Charter of Palermo. For us in Palermo, the international mobility is a human right. No one can be obliged just to live, to die, to be killed. Where the father and the mother let him be born without authorization. I did not auto give, give authorization. I did not give the authorization to my father, to my mother to be born in Palermo. I don't know if your parents ask the authorization to be born where you were born. My parents did not ask. And I think that the international mobility is human right. And this idea is changing the mind of people in Palermo. I received a fantastic letter from a girl, 20 years old, obliged just to live in a rolling chair, who wrote to me, Mr. Mayor, thanks. Since you welcome the migrants, I feel less different, more equal, more normal. <laughs> because the migrants remember us that we are human beings. And they, my life changed many times. Of sure, my life changed when the politicians and the mafiosi killed the Piazzanti Mattarella. And at that moment, the brother and the widow of Piazzanti asked me, young professor, 30 years old, to be involved in politics. And uh, when the president Mattarella was elected, I called him and said, Sergio, mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. Palermo is today capital of the culture. And I think it is necessary just to remember that we need migrants. My life changed when I met a young girl coming from Congo. She was so nice, 14 years old. The mayor of Palermo is coming to visit me. So kind, well-dressed just to welcome me. She read a poem in French language. At the end, she crying read, I'm so sad because I, I could not rescue my mother passing from the boat to the ship. This girl was not sad because she was not able to rescue the mother passing, passing from the boat to the ship. This girl was sad because she killed the mother to live. And they had in front of me the face of my granddaughter, Leila, uh, killing uh, my daughter, Eleonora, uh, to live. I, wa I was in the port of Palermo. I go always in the port of Palermo to welcome migrants, to say, I'm sorry for you, for, since this moment you are Palermitan. Just welcoming them. <laughs> just welcoming them. I was discussing with a group of young migrants, and I was saying what I normally say, don't worry, you are leaving, now we are free, the worst is past, and the future will be better than the past. There was one of these, those guys who did not wish to speak with me, refused to speak with me. I went by him. I did not understand why he doesn't wish to speak with me. I am accustomed uh, to meet the persons who do not wish to speak with, with me because they know me. But it never happened that somebody not knowing me doesn't wish to speak with me. Why? It was a provocation. I went by him and I said, don't worry, the was is passed. I gave my handy telephone number. Call me when you, when you, when you, when you, uh, need just to speak with me, no reply. After 10 minutes, without watching me, just in perfect English, he said, Mr. Mayor, how can I be happy? I killed the two brothers to live. I had in front of me the face of my brother Anthony, killing me and my brother Francis to live. And I remembered what happened in Dachau and Auschwitz. How many persons in Lagos 
saving their life turning hurt, letting die the brother, the sister, the mother, the friend. We will be processed for genocide. We will have a second process of Nuremberg. Our grandfather, our grandmother school to say, we did not know. We cannot say, we don't want to know. And the residents permit is uh, the new slavery, the new death penalty. The new slavery, the new death penalty. I know it was a long way to be free from uh, slavery. Uh, 56 years ago, somebody in the United States of America said, I have a dream. 56 years ago, not 500 years ago, said, I have a dream. And the Voltaire, the famous French philosopher, was a merchant of slaves. He became rich just selling and buying slaves. The death penalty, I know, is a long way to be free from death penalty. The city of Palermo is the only city in the world where uh, an American killed in Virginia, condemned to death, is buried. Before dying, he called me and said, my last desire, Mr. Mayor, is to be buried in Palermo, the only city who loved me. And we are proud to say no to the death penalty. And I remember that the Vatican abolished the formerly the death penalty in 2001. 2001. Uh, I'm Catholic. Therefore, it is politically correct to speak against the Vatican. <laughs> Otherwise, you should not speak against the Vatican. <laughs> The Vatican abolished formally the death penalty in 2001. It means that the Vatican could not uh, be a member of the European Union. Erdogan, yes, the Pope, no. Do you understand what does it mean? So long, it will be a long way to be faithful residents permit, but we are just on the way. And we wish to just to send the message that uh, respect uh, of human beings uh, uh, let Palermo become exciting and safe. Yes, exciting. Because we are something like a mosaic made by different pieces of stones of different colors, different dimension. That we wish to stay inside the framework. And the framework is respect of human rights. To be different because we are human beings. To be equal because we are human beings. And uh, in the city of Palermo, finally the dog, the cat, the mouse walk together. It doesn't happen in the other part of the world. And we are proud because uh, for the Mayo, there's no distinction between uh, people being born in, in Palermo. Yesterday I spent uh, four, three hours of my time, two hours with the Bangladesh community, one hour with the Vilnius community from Lithuania, so you can understand how fantastic is the city of Palermo that is exciting and safe. When some Muslims <laughs> arrive in Palermo, it could be dangerous. The Muslims living in Palermo call the mayor, and the mayor call the police. They defend their city before defending their homeland and their religion. It does happen in Nibali in Paris. It does happen in the city all around Brussels. My daughter, living since 13 years in Paris and in Quebec City, she has the same, she does the same mistakes of the father. She always with the migrants. She says, uh, Papa, if some Muslims arrive in Bali, it could be dangerous, nobody called the mayor. They close the eyes, the mouth. Uh, and some of them can hope that instead of one bomb, uh, these terrorists can let explode two bombs, not one. And I'm speaking about my daughter. She was in Bataclan that night. And she says, we are criminal because we don't welcome the migrants. And I think that the lesson coming from Palermo is exactly this, that the uh, to change is possible. To change is possible, we just change it. And we think that uh, Palermo has become just uh, a point, a meeting point for Mediterranean area.
Therefore, I am proud to say to you that Volosho Inca is Palermitan. <laughs> yes. Sure. Even, even when it's not in Palermo, because if you come in Palermo, you become Palermitan. I'm sorry for you, but you become Palermitan. <laughs> even if, if to, for two days as tourist, who arrives in Palermo is Palermitan. And Vole uh, is an honorary citizen of the city of Palermo. And I am really, really proud to be here with him. It will be a great pleasure to welcome him in Palermo. And we have in common the same hope for the future, the same respect for human rights, and we have in common the same editor in German language. But it's Nobel Prize and not the Nobel Prize. <laughs> And uh, just to, to finish to speak, just to end, I wish to tell you that I'm proud to be the mayor of the city of Palermo, where Don Pino Puisi, a Catholic priest, a close friend of mine, was killed by the mafia. He was killed by the mafia because he asked the school for the children. He did not use the weapons. He did not say I am against the mafia. He said I am for the rights of the children to have a school. And the mafia boss said the mafia for this simple Catholic priest than for the, the, the weapons of police and the sentences of the justice court. And killed him. And the Pope declared him beate. He meant to let the people forget too many bishops, too many cardinals corrupted and the friend of Mario Bos. I am in the same way proud because every year I organize the largest gay pride in South Europe. Human rights, human rights, LGBT rights, because the only way to build the future is to stay with Google and with Ahmed, but uh, on the side of Ahmed. Thanks. I just go straight. No. I, of course, uh, occupy two nationalities here as the famous nation of uh, Abel Kuta. <laughs> and if you haven't heard of it, well, all the worse for you, because that's easily is one of the greatest uh, cities, not only in Nigeria, but in all of the African continent and the black world. I come from there. Um, but you've heard names at least like uh, Fela and Nicola Bukuti, I'm sure the musician. Oh, I already see one or two <laughs> nods uh, over there, you see. Now, let me sort of take off, in a way, from a certain personal theme, a thread, which uh, Orlando uh, outlined regarding his own uh, background, and, and say that there are times when I feel that I've done nothing but swim in images. And uh, this is perhaps because uh, uh, images are so, such solid uh, precipitates of culture, of civilization, or in fact, quotidian life. My mind goes back, for instance, to um, one of the ventures I embarked upon together with my former student, uh, Professor Henry Louis Gates, who I'm sure you've all heard of, um, when uh, after I graduated and I became um, a fellow at uh, Cambridge, uh, England, and one of the first uh, collaborations which I had vis-a-vis -vis this was titled The Image of the Black in Western Imagination. Uh, I think there should be a few extant volumes of that around. And it's been a sort of continuing search, retrieval, restoration of the reality of what one experiences as a black person and as a former colonial uh, individual, colonial pro product. And the image that is projected by those former imperators, if I shouldn't use the word 
former, because to a large extent, they're still are dictating very much the fortunes and the reality of the African world. And perhaps it's as a, uh, a kind of subconscious need to retrieve the reality which I experienced as a child, especially in the world of images. Let me describe to you the courtyard <clears throat> of the paramount king of my town, for instance, uh, Abeokuta, the Alake of Abeokuta, uh, the same one who was uh, uh, chased off his throne by women who mobilized because he got a little bit too big for his, uh, for his boots. And so the women mobilized and chased him off. And uh, my mother was one of the, um, the lieutenants of Mrs. Ransom Kuti who led the horde, the Amazons, to chase him off his throne. However, culturally, what he represented was for me one of the most important things in my life. And uh, that sense of belonging was something <laughs> was something which was constantly at war with what my parents, for instance, who are very devout Christians, tried to instill inside me. If you entered that courtyard, you saw images, just images. Horsemen, kings, princes, priests, uh, gods. The meaning was very clear to me, of course, as a child, but I know that I enjoyed just wandering through that courtyard of finding a way of passing through it when I was sent on some errand in the opposite direction. Because, you see, these were pagan. These were pagan images. They were heathen images. We were not supposed to move near them. And so to be caught by my parents, for instance, uh, lingering and just even marveling at these images was uh, a crime that uh, earned punishment whenever we were reported at home. They were not Christian, and yet there was such a fascination, a fascination for me about them. They spoke, they were very eloquent. They represented what the Allah of Abel Kuta himself was a symbol of. Of course, it was not very well clearly defined in my mind at the time, but it was an alternative world to the world of the missionary compound where I was raised, and uh, of which I was supposed to be a sterling product, doing honor to my parents as good Christians, to the, uh, the canon, the head of the parsonage there. They were in a world apart from that, which I sensed intuitively from what those images represented. Now, to reinforce, reinforce that as well, fortunately, my paternal side was incorrigibly heathen. <laughs> Eventually, my grandfather fell under the, the ministrations of my parents, and he converted. But he never converted. Yes, he even, he even had a, a Christian chieftaincy title. But he remained, thank goodness, a pagan at heart. And when we went on holidays to Ishara, my paternal side, he made sure he took me to one side took me to the Oboni, that's the enclave of elders where all the various spiritual and semi-cult and semi-religious uh, ceremonials uh, took place, where the chiefs were, shall we say, anointed, consecrated. He made sure that I saw all of this. And he didn't have to work at it. I couldn't wait to say, uh, Grandpa, uh, when are we visiting uh, those friends of yours, the, the Oshubo? It was just something, uh, mad, there was something totally magical about it. And I must confess that even though I was a chorister, as a child I was a chorister in the uh, Anglican church, I enjoyed the music and nothing against it. I even enjoyed sometimes the, um, uh, the harvest uh, ceremonials, etc., etc. But it was just nothing as visceral, as earthy, as meaningful as those sights those uh, vestiges of what was supposed to be a lost world to me. And of course, as I developed, the contradictions increased. This time, it was not just my parents who put a negative stamp on those images. This time now, it was the colonial masters. They reinforced what my parents had learned. 
And then there was a contradiction in their lives. And this, it was this, that these heathen images, these works of the devil, somehow became fascinating objects, acquisitive craving for these same European Christians. I didn't know they had them in their galleries in Europe. I never been to Europe, not at that age, no. But I noticed that they never missed an opportunity of acquiring these images. Benin Kingdom, one of the most famous kingdoms on the African continent, which was raided by the uh, British colonial forces and destroyed. The British made sure that these bronze carvings, these busts, these ceremonials of the palace, they made sure that they were taken away to pay the cost of destroying the Benin Kingdom, destroying the palaces, destroying the precipitates of that civilization. Simultaneously, one knew, even though I hadn't been to Benin, one learned in history lessons that this was a kingdom which actually exchanged embassies with the king of Portugal as far back as the 14th century. And that even a prince was sent from Benin to go and stay in Lisbon, to stay in the court and learn the ways, the manners of the Portuguese. And that gifts constantly were exchanged. And yet this was a barbaric society which had to be destroyed by the British. It did not make sense. And this contradiction <clears throat> was most, uh, most eloquently expressed in the fate of the artistic works of the Benin Kingdom. And of course, in the Benin Kingdom, the Ife bronzes. Later on, of course, we ran into the Nok, uh, Nok civilization. In the East, digs brought up ancient cultures, narrated ancient ways of living, being gradually lost under the stampeding hooves of the Christian cavalry. And it was these contradictions, I think, which, which made such an impression, created a very creative tension in me, a need to recover, restore, to do a comparative, to have a comparative understanding of the gods of other societies on behalf of whom my own deities were being destroyed. And that has been a lifelong career. When I began the um, a series, the uh, uh, Lagos Black Heritage, one of the first themes that sprang to my mind was the theme of that very uh, brochure, which, is, uh, which some of you uh, might have seen, the black in the Mediterranean blue. Because I, by then, of course, one had come to understand that these uh, images did not stay in Europe alone. alone that they were even the Americans, that the religion that produced some of these works actually had transferred to places like Brazil, Cuba, Mexico, even Uruguay, Paraguay, <coughs> Peru. Mention it, till today, you have a very vital religious culture known as the culture of the Obisha. The slaves took this religion with them and where they didn't have the physical objects with them, they made the equivalents in Brazil. They created the candomblés, they retained the dances, the cuisine even, the clothing, the festivals. All this enlarged the scope of my existence as a black man. And so the task of, uh, of retrieving, as I said, of re reinforcing even my own culture within my own society, became just a matter of a, a cause, a way of living. I could no longer conceive of African <coughs> culture as being confined by saline waters to the African continent. I, have, I, have, I developed a habit when I finally traveled outside the African continent 
My first port of call is always the antique area because that's where you find masks which had escaped the British Museum <laughs> and were on sale in little, little shops in the black ghettos of Paris, Lisbon, Frankfurt, and of course, uh, in the Americas. I saw an extension, I felt an extension, just by walking through those cobbled streets. You could always sense the old part of any city. I made unerringly for it. And from time to time, when I was able to afford it, it gave me a sense, a very sweet sense of revenge, to be able to purchase a small figurine from the African continent and take it back to Africa. Well, I had to do a bit of starvation for it, but that little gesture somehow enlarged me as a person. When I directed Death and the King's Horseman, uh, in Chicago, uh, first in Chicago and then the United States. And we began uh, preparing the set for it. Uh, the set was designed by a uh, normal professional. But I needed it. It's a very beautiful set, minimalist, very imaginative, etc., etc. But I needed something, something palpable, concrete, which could diffuse an essence of what that play was all about. And I had a really marvelous adventure over that. This is what happened. I went as usual in the antique area, down Soho, where the antique shops uh, uh, located. And there I found a door. I said, I know that door. It's from next door, the Cameroon. And um, this is one of those instances when one doesn't feel guilty about playing the race card. <laughs> I, the uh, shop was actually uh, was run by a black American woman. I knew I couldn't afford that door when I heard the prize, <laughs> but I was determined to have it and use it during that production. It turned out that a Japanese couple had been there before me, and it had been tagged as sold. And lucky for him, he hadn't paid yet. Came the first time, came back the second time. The door was still there, he still hadn't paid for it. So I said, uh, sister, do you really think that this thing belongs in Japan? So well, the Japanese collector was ready to pay for it and take it back. And it was clear he could afford it. So I went back to the theater. So the Goodman Theater now, the play had shifted there. I said, can I have an advance on my royalties? So well, we could arrange it. So with those dollars in my pocket, I went back there. I said, listen, when those Japanese come, tell them that the Nigerian ambassador came here, saw that door, claimed it was stolen, said he could trace it back to its origin, and there's a huge diplomatic row round about to go on, round about to go on now. Just tell him that I said so. And if necessary, I'll come as the Consul General. So personally, <laughs> I identify myself. I said, because this door is going back to Nigeria with me. And so we played the race card. I hung around when the came <coughs> finally to pay for it. And she played her role. And she said, that man over there, you know, it's from the Secret Service of Nigeria. <laughs> Even a watch over seem not going to go away. So I advise you, go and look for a door, another door somewhere else. <laughs> we used that door throughout that production. At the end of it, I packed it. It's right outside my house as I speak. Just today. One of my proudest moments that I, we, I was able to play for a chain, the race card, without feeling the slightest guilt whatsoever. <laughs> But of course, that's a light side of collecting. That's a light side of relationship to one's own cultural uh, artifacts, etc., etc. But there's also the tragic side. The tragic side is when you see that journey, that journey of the human treasures now being replaced by a journey of humanity itself. To watch 
one's own people, to see video, reportage, etc., to see one's own people lining the bottom of the Mediterranean. Uh, the impulsion is dual. On the one hand, one understands, one understands the, the push, one understands the failure of one's society, of one's leadership, because nothing but failure leads to such a continuation of the slave journey. That's what it is in the end. We come here virtually under slave conditions, and yet we crave that life, that semi-life, that sub-life. They crave it, they prefer it to the one they are leaving behind. That's a failure of leadership. What can one do about it? Can a recuperation of culture help the reinsertion of productive life, of productive life in the lives of those people? The sense that whatever they're leaving behind has value even in the eyes of those, <clears throat> of those whose lands they're invading for a better life? Can even the consciousness of the worth of African life be raised by promotion of the creative products of that society? It's this combination, these thoughts, which lead to projects like this, the black in the Mediterranean, recovering history, and reminding people that even the civilization of the European world is not devoid of a very solid and valuable African input. And so we began this series, the black, the Mediterranean blue, beginning with various uh, European nations with border, uh, the Mediterranean, and we began with Italy, as it happened. For me, it's not the return of the axon obelisk that counts, really. It's the palpable contact of ordinary people with what I like to refer to as the cultural precipitates of one culture by another. It's that which really matters. The people, the ordinary people, who come in contact with what others have produced. Yes, you can have a huge political diplomatic ceremony. A symbol is being returned to Ethiopia, the axon. But the axon, the obelisk, is so remote from real life. It is there, one looks up to it. A, a, a kind of restorative process has taken place, but that's it. But for me, the real meaning of these creative works is the ability to live with them, to clean them when they break in pieces, to, to chase the woodwork, the woodworms away from the wood carvings. It's this tactile connection which I believe has the deepest meaning, both spiritual and aesthetic. And I want to thank uh, Yolanda for giving us this opportunity of bringing just a little portion of some of these works to Palermo and then also to Italy. And uh, it's just coming from uh, Haiti. I'll take part in the huge festival which, we, which is already going on in Palermo. And I urge you, if you have the chance, to take a look at it and see the brothers and sisters of these uh, marble uh, products of your own uh, country and see the relationship between issue, Yoruba deity and genus, the two uh, double-faced uh, Roman uh, god, uh, to perhaps even discover that you Italians, you actually can boast a goddess of the sewers. Now, we don't have one. To Achille, goddess of the sewers. I spoke about it in uh, Venice very recently. Once you recognize that, you're not faced. If the United States president says, some people are from a shithole. <laughs> because you know that even the gods are not embarrassed to preside over sewers. So culture has so many facets. And hopefully, as we bring our deities to you, you will be able to recognize the fact all these 
are merely passages to a single Godhead and to see the other as simply part and parcel of the whole gamut of humanity. Thank you very much. <laughs>
is a migrant city. For 100 years, Sicilian Islamic State, uh, sorry, Sicilian Mafia governed the city of Palermo. You know that Islamic State against the people were different. The Nazis are against the people who are different. The racist, not in my mind, the racist are against the people who are different. The, the Sicilian Mafia was against the people who were different. You can imagine that until I was 30 years old, I never met a migrant in Palermo. Never met a migrant. The only migrant that I, I met in Palermo were the nice German ladies coming to take care of the children of the good society in Palermo. I was educated by a German lady, but she was not a migrant, I mean. Because the mafia governed the city of Palermo, and governing the city of Palermo, of course, uh, uh, refused. There is, in one and a half, one single example of a migrant that has been just used as killer. They refused to use the migrants even as a normal killer. Because they were for the purity, for the purity of the identity. The, the so-called use sanguinis, who has produced the genocide in the world, who has produced the genocide, and many, many abortion. Because somebody has explained to the lady that the sons are of the women producing the son. The son are not of the persons who makes the sons, who makes the sons, the children. Are of the people who educated the children. Google and Ahmed. I spoke about Google and Ahmed because I, I, I wish just to communicate to you a vision. What do we do is inside the vision. Otherwise, we don't understand why we speak always about African, about people who are different. I mean, Google and Ahmed. I met the two Googles. They have another name, but. And they said, you are exactly like Ahmed. Terrible question. Dear Mayo, who is Ahmed? Ahmed is a migrant who arrived in Palermo, passing from a boat to a ship, and then reaching the port of Palermo. For you, Google, what is the state? Exactly like Ahmed. Somebody has told us the state is a closed space. Somebody defending with the flowers, somebody defending with the weapons. For Google, the state does not exist. For Ahmed, the state is not a closed space. What is for you, Google, the identity? The blood of your father, your mother? I am Sicilian because I was born in Sicily. I am Sicilian because my father and my mother were Sicilian. I am Sicilian because I am Sicilian blood. Uh, I will ask to some hematologue tonight the difference between my blood and your blood, my blood and your blood, my blood and your blood. I am Sicilian because I decide to be Sicilian. I cannot, I cannot be condemned to be Sicilian while my father and my mother were Sicilians. And uh, I, probably in the next five minutes, I decide to be French and Hindu or Spanish and uh, Jewish. And uh, it is against the so-called the use of sanguinis. Use sanguinis. How many times we have said that the children are of the mother, of the father? And we have condemned many women just to, to avoid to let the child be born. I am, of course, for abortion. It's not a problem. But I ask why we say that my life changed when I was 10 years old. I was in an aristocratic palace in Palermo. Two, I was 10 years old. Two old persons, a marquis and a count, were just uh, discussing. And at the, they were just injuring each other. At the end, one of the two just uh, finished the kit of injuries and say to the other, your daughters are not your daughters. I will never forget the eyes of this 
a dead man who said the children are not of people who let them be born, but of people just let them to grow up. If you say that my daughters are not my daughters, I reply, I'm sorry for you, it's too late. <laughs> now they are my daughters. <laughs> you, you understand what does it mean? What terrible change of mind, homeland. Homeland is uh, ed, uh, something like uh, an agraphic condemnation. I am obliged to have as homeland Italy, because my father and my mother, without asking my authorization, <laughs> let me be born in Italy. You are lucky because your father, your mother asked you where to be born. My parents did not ask me where to be born. It is for Google. Which is the homeland for Google? which is the homeland for Ahmed. The same for me. I decide my homeland. Uh, if, if I decide to be Italian, uh, may I tell you that it has a double value? A double value? Why we can avoid that somebody being born in, in Amman, in Bangladesh, in, in Berlin, can decide to have as identity, Sicilian identity? Why cannot? Why cannot? Or to decide to have a homeland, Italy, why not? Or Europe, why not? So, all what we do when we speak artistically, we do inside this scenario. So you can understand this for us is completely normal. Uh, if somebody surprises, has to ask if he has a respect of human rights. Mine is not a question. I just wanted to say to Mayor Orlando, as a fellow Sicilian and somebody who's followed this political trajectory from the beginning, how glad I am to see that uh, you have kept the enthusiasm of 35 years ago. <laughs> glad to see you Thank again. Thank you. Grazie. More questions? Yes. You probably, you probably know that I love the life. I love the life. <laughs> Therefore, I'm against the mafia because the mafia does not allow, love the life. <laughs> um, I have a question on the use of the image or the symbol that uh, you, you created, the logo that you wear on your tie um, and is on this folder, and how that, <laughs> how that affected the, the consciousness of the city of Palermo. I noticed, I couldn't even remember where. I was there a week ago and I couldn't even remember where, but I read about the logo. I remember now that it was in your in the town hall, um, but yeah, I'd like to know more about that. First of all, I have to say to you that the cost of this logo was one thousand euro. It's because we decided not to just to to call some really important world well known agency, but just to have an agreement with the Academy of Fine Arts. I led the students to decide the logo. And uh, we had a competition. Mm -hmm. And uh, the director selected, uh, among 28, selected the 10 of the proposals of logo. And the, 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 the jury was composed by me, by the deputy mayor for culture, by da Dasha Maraini. Dasha Maraini, the writer, is just a member of the so-called uh, Executive Committee of Palermo, Capital of the Culture. And then we, we choose, we're chosen three, and at the end, we're chosen this one. All the three finalists were three uh, girls. I'm sorry for the young students, but I'm sorry. And she's again, there are four P, and one is P of Palermo, the other four P are P, Phoenix, Jewish, Arabic and Greece. President, uh, Prime Minister Gentiloni and Dario Franceschini, Minister for Culture, arrived on Monday in Palermo and in Opera House. And they had the Opera House just to show the new logo. It was a surprise. <laughs> the night before, I just was thinking to this logo, and I remember that in, in 
Quranic, Arabic language, P does not exist. Does not exist. So I let find the girl, mm -hmm. just asking where is coming the P? <coughs> Because in Arabic language, in Quranic, uh, Arabic language, the P is B, Balarm. Just, just P is read like B. And this girl <laughs> said, mm -hmm. I found this, this P in Syrian Arabic language. That was not the Arabic of Quran. It should be a serious problem just to use a different language, a different Arabic language. Lucky, the difference between so-called Syrian Arabic language and PB, uh, Arabic Quranic language, is that in the Syrian Arabic language, this green has down three points. PB in Arabic Quran at only one point. So we cancel the two points, okay. <laughs> so no problem, no diplomatic problem. <laughs> And then, then we gave just the prize to this girl, 1,000 euro. That was the final cost of the operation. But it's the one way just to send the message that we are a community intercultural. It is fantastic because, as you can see, for instance, here, we use different P for Palermo. And every time we have in just in our uh, documents uh, a P, uh, we decided to use Arabic or Jewish or Phoenix or Greece or Italian. It's one way just to send the message that we are a mosaic. And we have a beautiful logo, thanks to this ragazza, this young ragazza. woman. <laughs> so maybe one more question, okay? Oh. Um, hello, I just wanted to uh, thank all of you for, for the conversation. My question is for um, Mr. Soyinka, um, and it was about when you were talking about the volumes of books um, that I think were created together with, uh, with Gates, um, you said the image of the black in Western imagination. And I think the book is the image of the black in Western art. And so uh, if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between imagination and art within this context where you're talking about stereotypes. <clears throat> well, you know, we went through, as happens always, you go through so many titles. Heaven knows which one sticks in your mind you will forget which one you eventually landed with. But all around the whole notion, the theme of how the Western world sees the black individual. And of course, simultaneously, because that's inevitable, how do the blacks themselves, how do they see themselves? So you're quite right, you know, I, I haven't even seen a copy for the past few decades. So <laughs> I won't even recognize it if I see it. But you're right, there's no, no difference intended. No the, the book is in the library here. <coughs> for students, but the series of books is in the OK, so is there any uh, urgent question, or shall we continue the conversation in Palermo? <laughs> uh, shall we do that? Okay. Come and see with your eyes how wonderful is the yeah. city of Palermo. Come encounter the black in the Mediterranean blue. Ellen, do you want to? Bless us for Palermo in all the languages and all the religions. <laughs> no, okay. No, <laughs> but thank you all for coming, and we do hope to see you in Palermo for the faculty. We sent out something today for any of you who would like, because we have many of our wonderful faculty here present papers in the conference. We sent out today um, or yesterday um, a call for papers. We're we're a little bit late, but we're going to get. We are on, you know, Mediterranean time. Grazie a tutti. Thank That's you very true. much to our wonderful speakers and to the hostess and to you all.